Check, check. Don't quit on me now, please. Please. Thank you. What? Um, this, this, my friend's band's going to be the first band, and we were discussing like what band she'd play second. Mm -hmm. And she was saying that like, maybe Walt Mink could do the show. That would be How cool. are they live? Really, really good. I mean, it's been really hard for them to um, make the transition between playing in somebody's basement and then going to uh, live. But they played at the Metro. They opened for Blake Babies while you guys were gone, I think. Uh -huh. And they were really good. I was really surprised because I had never seen them in a place bigger than like the Uptown Bar in Minneapolis. played there once. I think I saw you guys last year when you played in the entry. Did you guys play in the 7th Street entry last year? Like the night they got in their car accident, I think that was last September. That was when the magazine had just started out, I think. You're also fucked up. Really? This is what it looks like now. You might want to take one home. Um, well, you know what? I don't know if... I can't remember the girl's name who, who started this. And She was my roommate for a while. Um, I did this really long interview with her, and I don't know if they even ever came out. Did it ever come out? I, it, I don't know why it never ran, but it didn't run. She told me so. it was like... First she told me it was going to run this one month, and, she said, and then I saw her when we played that show, and she yeah. said, she said um, it'll be in the next month's issue, and then I, I, I never heard about it, so I assume it never came out. It didn't run. I think what happened was when she interviewed you the first time, or mm -hmm. when she interviewed you that time, she was working for another magazine, Polly and she said, and then that folded, and then by September she had started up another one of her own, <clears throat> and uh, I met her and said, I'll help you out. And, uh, I think it's a really good magazine. I was just disappointed we didn't get in it. Yeah. Well, that was. I told her that she. It would be in her best interest to run it. This was even before you guys. I knew that anything was going to be happening on Carolina or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, she. Ju it just never ran. And so now it's kind of like. Now I feel like it's kind of a bandwagon thing. You know, like everybody has stuff on Smashing Pumpkins. I guess we have to too. <laughs> but. That's a. Believe me, that's a weird position to be in. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. Have you ready? Uh, I'm kind of am. Are you? I'm not hungry. I was just gonna get some of the Okay. Um, I'd like. I would like. Uh, jeez. Dosa keys, I guess. Can I have an ashtray too, or can I ice cream? I want to get um a house salad. Yeah. What kind of dressings do you have? Only French. Only French? Yeah. I guess I'll be having French dressing. <laughs> Anything else? Thanks. But uh, anyway, yeah, so you guys got a lot of press, and so she was kind of like, you live in Chicago, you can talk to them. But before that, we got like zero press. Well, nobody, nobody really big has done a big feature on you either, you know, which, I mean, I was really glad that I was going to have a chance to talk to you for an extended period of time, or at least know how to get a hold of you if I needed anything else, because uh, you guys deserve a lot more than what you've gotten. Well, I think people have been kind of, um, the weird thing I think about us is like, I mean, this seems to be like an underlying tone between a lot of the press we've gotten, it's like, it's, it's not, a, it doesn't seem to be a question of whether or not we're good. I just think that, I think really people really question from what point of the, like, like I've had, I've had interviews come out and ask me directly, what angle are you coming from? Mm -hmm. And it's like, all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins wasn't, con be, wasn't conceived to be like other bands to start with. Right. And, I mean, ultimately is music and so it's comparable in a sense that it's music but as far as like our philosophies and and why we do what we do and the and from what angle we're coming from i think it's really different than most bands and, and because of that i think people have a really hard time trying to you know it's not it's not easy to just say oh I, you know i can relate to this it's, mm -hmm. you know it's uh, you know like, like a band like mud honey or something it's it's really easy to understand where they're coming from right, you know? right. so you you judge it on the merit of what it's trying to be, you know. Do you think that your band is pretty much a showcase for your work? Just yours? Um, your songwriting, your arranging, your vocal technique, whatever. I mean, it looks to me like you pretty much have your hands in all aspects of, of everything, down to promotion and production yeah. and artwork and, you know, do you feel... But the, 
the, the, the thing is, is um, same same type of context. Uh, I mean, I have had my hand in everything. Mm -hmm. There's no denying that. But there is something that a band, you know, as opposed to like say I just wrote songs and then I had these people play with me. There's something that a band brings, and there's a sense of unity and spirit, a collective spirit, that adds some kind of intangible ingredient that I could never conceive of on my own. And I have this really good friend who's, um, he was the leader of the band Skunk, if you know that mm -hmm. band. Uh, One of the Mats? Yeah, and uh, Sweeney. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, he was talking to another friend of mine, and, 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 and she told me, she said, you know, he said that there's no, he knows of no other band that operates like the Pumpkins operates. Mm -hmm. Most people from the outside kind of perceive it as this Spangali dict dictator type thing. But for someone to actually come and, and be around us and see how mm -hmm. it actually works, it's not like that at all. Right. It's, it's very much my vision, it's very much my push, but I, I, I will not uh, diminish the, the the importance and the contribution of the people in my band, you know. I mean, it is my band. I started it. I named it. And, but it's it's like, I mean, how do you explain to someone who, um, from the outside, you know, it's like, it's this precious thing that's kind of really hard to explain. I dig with that. I mean, Ann and I started that. And, I mean, it's the same thing. You, you're really protective, I think, of... of I mean, one, that's what I gather from you. You don't come, I mean, I think the press is kind of slanted toward making you out to be this singer, songwriter, guitar hero kind of dude that has these people around him and they're at your beck and call and you run the practices and, you know, whatever. I mean, I think they're kind of slanted toward that, but I can, like, at, for, when I first read what you said in Spin, you know, like, when you're like, I don't know give a fuck what, you know, they, all the bands in Chicago told me what I didn't want to sound like and all that other stuff. First I was kind of like, you know, what an asshole. But then I was like, but I get it, you know, it's like, all the press that I read and all these press kits shows me what I don't want my magazine to look like, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, I had to just put it in my own context to really understand. I mean, <coughs> musicians, musicians are people in bands, whatever you want to call them. The majority of them are really concerned what people think of them, mm -hmm. how they're going to perceive their opinions, their dress, you know. And my whole life has been one series of, of events after another where I've had to reestablish and reprove the identity, a personality which is uh, not an easy personality to get through life on. And it's just come down to a choice between being a fucking pussy or just being the person that I am. And I thought, you know what? People are going to slag us anyway. They're going to question our, our credibility and all these other things, which we're getting like every day. And so why not? Why not just stand up and say what I want to say? The first interviews that I did, I held my tongue. And I read them and I thought, you know, you're a fucking pussy. Why don't you say, you know, I think it'd be a better world if everyone kind of spoke their mind. Why do you think, when I moved down here, you know, I'm waving this CD going, this is the best thing I've heard all year, blah, 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 you know, and everybody was like, one of the girls I work with just kind of, I mean, I hate her. She, she, um, it was like my first week at work, my boss had just gotten fired, the person who hired me had just gotten fired. I don't like the label, but I, you know, I just wanted to see what it was like. I want to be a writer, but I just wanted to get in see what was going on, you know, in that end. She stands there with her hands on her hips, and she's like, don't you know that everybody in Chicago hates the Smashing Pumpkins? And I was like, like, I fucking care. I mean, why? Why, why is that? I mean, and it's not just from, like, she's like a metal chick, you know, she works at Medusa's, and she's like a total, you know, whatever. And but you know what? Not everybody in Chicago I know that. Hates you guys, pumpkins. I mean, that's the thing. But, like, a lot of the people that I've run into, a lot of scene people, you know, have been kind of like, well, you know, yeah, whatever. But I was in Danny's one night, and it came on. It was like, you know, one of your songs came on, and it was like, it was perfect. And, you know, I, can, I just, I guess it's just beyond my realm. I don't understand. You know, if you like music, why can't you just say it if you like a kind of music? Or is it something that's happened in Chicago? Well, it mainly it, it mainly stems from, I was never a scenester. 
Uh, I was never in a punk rock band. My roots musically in Chicago don't go back to like 83, right, like a right. lot of people, you know, like, you know, quote unquote, the leading seamsters, like, you know, uh, touch and go people or wax tracks people. I wasn't a part of those scenes. Chicago in 84, 85 was completely vacant. And the only thing that was creating any interest locally was hardcore. Al Jurgensen got zero respect here. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody cared. Nobody cared about Big Black. All the all the icons of the Chicago indie scene, nobody gave, gave a fuck about them. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 17 and all the people that were my age, they didn't care about those bands. They were listening to The Cure and Echo and the Bunny Man. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a part of that. I felt I, I never felt a part of that. And you know, I moved to Florida in '86, and I had this band. And you know, the closest thing I ever came to like a punk kind of band. So when the Pumpkins came out and created like this immediate impression on people like Joe Shanahan, mm -hmm. uh, people who had power as far as booking gigs and stuff, it was like everyone was like, "Who the fuck is this band?" I mean. For all intents and purposes, we were like a band from out of town, and people treated us like that. Right. We got snubbed very early by a lot of local bands. People started dissing us who'd never even seen us. And when you're when you're young and you're you're uh, you're trying to form something that's important to you, and people are saying things about it, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're just gonna back up against the wall even harder and mm -hmm. tell everyone to fuck mm -hmm. off. So we never played games with anybody, and without anybody's help except the people who you know could book shows we managed to start drawing you know within a year within a year and a half we were drawing 800 plus people i mean urge overkill is you know i'm not i'm not dissing them because i like them even though they diss us all the time i mean they're on their what fourth album you know they can't consistently draw 800 people so it was like there was this immediate jealousy who the fuck is this band and why are they drawing these people and i would look at out in our crowd and there'd be There'd be uh, yuppies from the suburbs, and there'd be death chicks, and there'd be rock dudes, you know? So it crossed all those boundaries, mm -hmm. and you couldn't classify us, and every three months we were changing. Do you feel some sort of satisfaction in that? It's, you know, a lot, a lot of that initial... I mean, people are dissing you harder now, I think, maybe than they were before. Oh, yeah. Because of the success that you've enjoyed, but do you feel... I mean, when you come right down to it, the scenesters and all the label people in this town don't really matter when you're drawing as many people well, as you draw. When you're getting tours like you guys are getting tours, and when you're getting courted by majors, where they're still going to totally allow you creative control, which a lot of bands can't speak for because they suck, you know? So it's kind of like, do you feel sort of any perverse sense of satisfaction or like, I told you so, or fuck you, you know? If you're so fucking great, then why are you guys still stuck in the lounge acts every third month, you know? I'll tell you what. When we were here and we were competing directly against bands week after week, I felt that way. Now that I'm out in the real world, and now I feel that our band is like a part of a bigger community, mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. I have more important things to do with my life and my time worry about what, you know, local scenester number seven right. thinks about us. That's cool. Well, you don't, I mean, Chicago may be a big town, but it's a small scene. It really is. It's like Minneapolis. Yeah. A little different, but same thing, you know, when I first came here and I went out, I met everybody I needed to meet if I ever wanted to meet them in two nights. And... It was like, you know, who cares? I, I don't know. Because I was trying to get away from that when I was in Minneapolis. But I guess I thought that was kind of a stupid move. Tr going to wax tracks and expecting to just kind of blend into the woodwork, you know. But I was really a lot more interested in coming down here to get closer to the blues thing. To write about that. Or to write about artists that were coming through that wouldn't normally be up in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. You know, I have total easy access to Dave Turner, but who cares, you know. It's like the guy I've known him for six years. I'm not going to interview him every day, you know. But uh, so this is a it's a weird town for that. I mean, and when you say Chicago band, or if somebody was saying, well, you know, 
or Chicago band, I either draw a blank or think of Wax Tracks. I never even thought of TNG really as being a Chicago thing, ever. But I hear that all the time now that I'm here. Yeah. Well, the past couple of years it's kind of grown. Yeah. What, what do you do with your time besides music, or is it pretty much a 24-hour day job? I'm, I'm totally a freak. Do you listen to a lot? I read somewhere you don't really listen to anything new. I try not to. Yeah. It's too, too influences me too much. Really? I, I just have to be realistic and admit it. You know? mm -hmm. Well, that's fabulous. So. Have you heard anything new that's cool that you like? Just by chance, or do you go out? I mean, do you like go out and hang out at bars, or do you pretty much stay out of the thing? Do people recognize you? Do you um, freak I, out on the... I pretty much stop going to bars. I go see band when I really want to see band. Yeah. I'm not into the rock star trip, so I mean, I get recognized all the time now. It's nice. People are really nice and stuff. Yeah. But it's not. It's not. It's got nothing to do with that as to why I don't go out. I just um. It's really hard to explain, but it's just really have if you if you're really intent on making music that's going to be like real real music. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of mental energy, mm -hmm. and some of the best music that's coming out today, even though it's good and listenable, and it's just fucking rehash. And I am I am really really intent. On redefining my my little genre here. Do you think your your for the next record? Do you think it's going to be different from this one in terms of the sound? Mm -hmm. Are you going to go with the same producer? Mm -hmm. He's great. His bands suck. His own bands <laughs> suck, but he's really good. He's amazing. When you said in an interview or in a couple interviews that you threw your life into this last record and that it exhausted you, did he understand that? Like, is he an artist from that standpoint where you, I mean, you're totally, you're totally, like, feeling this whole project, like, everywhere? I know? think, I think he threw his life into it. As much as someone, you know, I mean, wasn't like we were up all night praying or anything. <laughs> but, but, I mean, but he gets it. He, he, gets sacri it. he sacrificed his, his own personal comfort mm -hmm. to make that record. And we were putting in some really long, long days. How long did it take you to record it? It was two months of total, like, it was 40-something days or something like that. Something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It was over a four-month span of time. Had you spent time in a, in a smart studio? is like a cool studio. Mm -hmm. I may have been in there. Did you, were you really familiar with all the knobs and all that other stuff? I mean, did you, well, we'd, or did you we'd did actually, you um, we'd recorded, um, well, we recorded up, we did our Sub Pop single verse. I've been up there before. Mm -hmm. And we had actually done 19 songs of demo at, at this guy's, excuse me, at this guy's home studio. So I'd spent a lot of time in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I, um, the knob part of it is not really important, you know. It's mm -hmm. all in the, you know, that's why you have someone like him. You know? mm -hmm. How'd you meet him? Um, Mike Potential referred us to him. For, <laughs> really? Yeah, he said, you should really should go with Butch Vig. This is the guy for you. Mm -hmm. So when the Sub Pop single came up, we said, we said, uh, how about Butch Big? And they were like, that's who we, you know, that's what Sub, Sub Pop was like. That's who we were thinking of for you. So Sub Pop called Butch, we called Butch. And it's just that simple. I mean, you know, for, for, from Butch's standpoint, um, I think what he really likes about the Pumpkins is that, I mean, he's done a lot of bands like Laughing Hyenas and mm -hmm. stuff like that, Kill Those. Or, and, I mean, Butch is, a, Butch is a sucker for, you know, for melodies and just look at his bands, you know, that's kind of what they're right. based on, they're melodic bands. And I think with us, he really enjoys the marriage of melody and, and power, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, and, uh, I think he, that's probably why he, uh, well, look at, and look at Nirvana. Nirvana. It's a great record. It's a really great record. Yours and theirs are probably, you know. And, and, and who'd have thought, you know, two years ago when Sub Pop was riding high, that the little melodic voice would be winning the war, right, you know? Right. Do you think Nirvana is like an example of what I wanted to pose to you in terms of a major label deal? You know, I mean, what's it going to take 
you know, they got a huge advance for three records, and they didn't, I, you know, to me, they didn't really compromise anything. If anything, they got a lot better, mm -hmm. and uh, probably will continue to do so. You know, I mean, is that when you're when you're talking to majors, what? I mean, have you gotten some really fucked up offers from people where they're just like, you know, they're trying to bind you into some like, you know, wild contract? Not where, anymore. So you're pretty much able to call the shots. Yeah. No. So when you sign, are you going to sign? Hmm? Who are Probably. you going to sign with? I, I don't like to talk. I never talk about business. Okay. I just. <clears throat> That's okay. I'm just curious. Because uh, they got a pretty good deal with Geffen, although. When I talk to their publicists, they're totally swamped. They don't even know what to do because it's selling so many records right now. They can't really be effective. The publicity department. Yeah. Are you surprised at all your success? Are you like? It's much more than I thought it would be. It doesn't surprise me that people like our record. Mm -hmm. I think a lot more people got it than I think would got would have gotten it. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty dense record. Very dense. I think you can, you know, it's. I I think, I mean, not to totally blow my own horn, but I, I think, I never go too far into into to the point. Of, I, I think we're really good listeners. Mm -hmm. and I think we're really good censors of our own music. I mean, I think we try to censor out a lot. I mean, like we have this little saying. This song's more fun than, to play than it is to listen to, mm -hmm. and I think that we we always it's not so much like a it's not so much like a thing like you know you're sitting around thinking what's somebody gonna want to listen to, mm -hmm. but you I mean for you to to play something that is not gonna take the listener with you then that's not a, then you're then you're wasting your time. Right. I mean there has to be a marriage of drawing someone in. You mentioned that before when you when you said that all of a sudden you discovered that when it's a totally self-serving thing, it's that's not what it's all about. You know, I think your record can probably be interpreted in a, you know, it's different for everybody who buys it, I think. You know, and that's, you know, like listening to a winger record is not going to call back any kind of memory to me at all, but, you know, like listening to somebody like, you know, something like your record or the Nirvana record, or can you think of anything else that I've heard, you know, that it, 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 wants it, you? You know, it's, um, a lot of music presumes that the listener wants to be fed something as opposed to, like, a roller coaster ride or something, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at a ride and you want to ride it because it looks enticing mm -hmm. and then the ride in itself is an experience and you have mm -hmm. to create that inducement to get the person onto the ride you know and that's that's really where it's at that's that's why you know people put hooks in songs you mm -hmm. know so that you'll hum them and you want to go back right. and put that song on again it's just you know I'm, it's it's not a shameful thing to want to write something that somebody might want to listen to mm -mm. what about the other members of the band i mean you guys all get along. Mm -hmm. We get along better now than we did like, like a year ago. Mm -hmm. How come you weren't getting along before, or it wasn't as good as? It, it was, was mostly frustration on my part because I really didn't feel they were understanding. I I've taught a lot of philosophy to my band. You know, I mean, I don't want that to sound like scholarly. I'm, I've constantly fed them this kind of dogma pumpkin dogma, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, because I wanted, to, it was kind of like with the idea that if we could reach a point, we would reach a point, a plateau, like say we're at a plateau now, mm -hmm. and rather than, rather than have it, have the experiences that we've had point all into one direction, it would be the other way around. Mm -hmm. Our experiences would lead us outward. Right. So I've always tried to, you know, Put things in a context that were that were more that were more uh, that would lend themselves to bigger and better experiences mm -hmm. as the band went on, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know like there's bands that back themselves into a corner with mm -hmm. their music. They could they they redefine what they do, but they redefine it to a point where they can't move from that right. point. And 
you know, um, you know, a lot of people, like, I've talked to a lot of people that said, you know, I saw you guys, you know, like, two years ago, and you really sucked, but, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that we were, we weren't even good, but the people that liked us, I think, could understand the ambitiousness mm -hmm. in what we were trying to do. We were trying to cover a lot of ground, mm -hmm. and, and where most bands just kind of latch on to one or two things, and that's why it's easy for them to get good in a year or something. I mean, we were trying to do 10 things, and we're still, now, now that we can do 10 things, we're trying to do 20. Right. And, you know, uh... So, okay, so, like, what about... I'm sorry, I'm answering questions that you haven't even asked no, me. No, but that's good, because it gives me more to think about. But, so, like, what about, I mean, so, like, say, for example, Darcy, has her vision become your, or your vision become her vision as well? You know, I'm not, I'm obviously... I, I I know I know the band members well enough to know their own personal mm -hmm. slants. I would say, like Jimmy, the drummer's vision is pretty much strictly relegated to his instrument. Right. So over time, his vision for his drumming is tied into the vision of the band. Mm -hmm. James is the furthest along as far as songwriting goes, mm -hmm. and James has a very distinct personality. And what we're trying to do now is he's writing a bunch of new songs. He's finally starting to write. He's finally starting to contribute. Mm -hmm. Is is walk the fence between his own identity mm -hmm. and not have it be like here's a James song. Right. So there's a marriage there mm -hmm. between his identity and what the band does because the the scope of the band is wide enough that you know you can go out in different directions. Mm -hmm. Um, Darcy, I'm not quite sure what her vision is of music. Um, Darcy's the person I probably understand the least, uh, just in terms of what goes on inside her head. We have disagreements all the time just because we don't understand each other. Right. Um, musically, I don't, I'm not, I, I can't say whether she'll ever, you know, uh, she's never written a song that I've heard, so for all I know she's the greatest songwriter in the world, you know. I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. I, you know, um, it's just it's just trying to establish an air of, of creative comfortability where someone can feel like they can be themselves. Right. And and I mean we are we are definitely four distinct personalities. And the longer we play, the more those personalities emerge, and and it's only strengthen the vision and the and the and the, the unity of the band. I don't want, you know, three spineless fucks behind me. That's really lame. Right. I used to scream at them because I'd look over at them in the middle of the gig and they look bored. That's, you know, you know, this is their band too. And they benefit and they make money from it. So when you bring in a song, like to a rehearsal or something, I mean, do you have the arrangement in your head? Can you hear it in your head? The sometimes, whole thing? sometimes I can, sometimes I just can. So do they, do they help arrange? Do they pretty much do their own? You bring in like a melody or something? No, most of the arrangements are fine. You do the arrangements, okay. Do you see yourself as some sort of like maverick or? I mean, obviously you're very gifted. If that's if if what you're saying is true, you know, you're doing the songwriting and the lyrics and the arrangements and stuff. I mean, do you? Is that frustrating sometimes? Is that that's what I was with? talking. That's why I like. Yeah. Because. I mean, it, it, this sounds really weird to tell someone I don't know, but it's it, to have all this this energy and this vision, and, and, you're, and you're trying so hard to eke. You know what I mean? It's like the Smashing Pumpkins have had one of the most successful independent albums of the last like five or six years. Most people would be resting on their laurels and patting themselves on the head. I'm doing exactly the opposite. I'm trying to rethink how I can push my band to its furthest outermost boundary, mm -hmm. not lose what we've established, right. but really break ground musically and really get beyond something. And, and you know, it's, it's really frustrating to, to have this, I mean, because we got this momentum and there's power behind it, and, and have this vision and this energy, and then somebody just doesn't share that naturally. Mm -hmm. It's not even like they don't think, they don't agree with you. It's just not that natural spark to want to get out of bed and before you get dressed, pick up a guitar and start right. to play. Not everybody has that. And, you, and the frustration came from wishing, wishing that people would be something that they weren't. And ever since I stopped wishing so hard that they would change and, and just accept them as the people they are and start to promote the strength that they do have, 
this, the whole chemistry in the band has changed. It's a lot more, um, I don't know, it's a lot more together. So do you apply that philosophy to other people that you meet? I mean, like your friends, uh, your other friends who are artists, like maybe writers or painters, or even just people who have desk jobs. I mean, do you get frustrated with them as well for not... And that's, I'm not talking about your musical vision here. I mean, it sounds like there's more behind. Mm -hmm. Music is like your vent yeah. or whatever, you know. And I mean, do I get frustrated with... With people in general. Um, I mean, is it hard for you to understand, say, like, you know, a total mainstream person? Or you go home, you go back to Glen Ellen, or you go mm -hmm. wherever, and these people are just so out of your realm. And it's not a bad thing. You don't look down on them, but, you um, know... I mean, that, I mean, I can because I can understand that it's really hard. Like when you have all that. I've kept, I've kept very much in touch with the per, the person in me that's very normal. It's not that hard for me to relate. But when you're in that arena, that right. aesthetic, artistic arena, that's a totally different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 normal human being me in me is completely retarded because I've spent the last six, seven years of my life working on this, you know, this maniacal. Uh, vision of mine, you know. When you started playing guitar, how old were you? I mean, I know 15. you... Okay, so you kind of avoided it until then, I read, because your dad, it was something that you associated with your dad. And you didn't yeah, it was kind of a negative thing. Mm -hmm. So, did you take lessons, or did you teach yourself? I taught myself. So, what did you listen to to teach yourself? I mean, who... Hendrix, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest. Do you think you're a good guitar player? I'm not as good a guitar player as I could be. Are you a better songwriter than guitar player, you think? I don't look at it that way. It's hard because that's 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 like apples and oranges. Right. Um, I play guitar. The, the style of guitar that I played influenced my songwriting. Well, now my songwriting influences the way that I play guitar. The two are sim. sim Biotically connected, but I spend so much time working on songs that my guitar playing is is not reached the level that it could have had I solely concentrated on guitar. How about how about your voice? I mean, did you ever consider yourself a singer, or were you did you ever plan on singing in your band? No, I, I started singing strictly by not accident, but it, it took someone else prodding me. I you know the band that I had in '86. There's a guy in the band, and he sang, and he said, you've got to sing, you know, it's just really stupid that you don't sing. You can sing. You Were can you writing the note. songs for that band as well? Um, I was writing the music, but I wasn't writing the singing, and then that's when I started to write my own songs. Mm -hmm. That's what eventually divided that band, because he had songs, and I had songs, and songs like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I mean, do you think anybody else could sing your songs? Does anybody else in the band sing? James sings. Darcy sings. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Darcy, that's my, Daydream's my song. Yeah. I don't, I don't think anybody else can sing my songs like the way that I sing them, right. with the same kind of push and pull, if that makes any sense to you. I mean, I don't have the strongest voice and I don't have the weakest voice, and I'm constantly kind of, you know, I don't know, I walk this line with my voice, and so I don't think anyone could sing like I sing, because I think the way I sing is very unique, because I... My, my singing influence ours is our zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can tell. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I just sing. I mean, this singing is the most natural thing that I do because I, there's no influences because I couldn't sing. If I could sing, like I, if I had this wonderful voice, who knows what I'd sing? Like, probably like Robert Plant or something. It depends on what you consider a wonderful voice, though, too. I mean, it's, well, I mean, the four for octave range. Well, for your, but the music that you write, mm -hmm. I think your voice... I can't, I can't hear somebody like Robert Plant singing right. the songs that, that you guys play, or well, Perry like, Farrell, mm -hmm. or anybody else. But it's like everything, you know, the, it's all grown together. Right. You know? My songwriting has grown as my singing has grown, and, and it's only, you know, one thing has embellished the other, and it's kind of like this give and take. But I think that I could write songs that other people could sing. Mm -hmm. I think I write good enough songs that you might, it might, I mean, it's like Daydream. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a demo of me singing that song, and it's still a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. But she added something to it that I, I just don't have. Do you think that ultimately in the future, Smashing Pumpkins are not going to be the vehicle that you would want to use? I mean, obviously you don't feel like you've peaked creatively. So, like, what well, I, I see, I definitely see uh, a point where the band can't go on any further. 
So did you just become a solo artist, or would you go through the process again of finding people where the personalities clicked? I've thought about that, you know, and it, I just think of, of how much communication, un, you know, like, it's like when you've had a boyfriend or a girlfriend for a long time, and, and, and there's a lot of things you don't even have to say. There's a lot of body language that you understand, that if you met someone new, you'd have to, and I feel like you have to explain yourself all the time. And I, boy, just the thought of having to go through that with new people would be really difficult. Because I, I, I have a great luxury in the fact that, you know, I, I have um, three people who though, they think I'm kind of a goof, you know, they trust my instinctive nature. And it would be really hard for me to play with someone that didn't trust my instincts. You know? Not to say that there aren't people who have different instincts that aren't correct for them. But, you know, this is the way that this situation worked out. Did, did they trust you immediately? Or, like, were your... And from what I've read or from what I understand, everybody kind of gradually came into the fold, you know, like, when we first hooked up with James. Mm -hmm. I, think they I think they trusted me up until a point. Mm -hmm. And the way that I... The way that I garnered this like deep trust to convince people to, to change and alter their lives for this this band was everything I ever said happened. I would say we we're going to do this, and we would do it, mm -hmm. and we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this and this, and it, it all happened every bit of it. Mm -hmm. There's not one thing I've ever said that didn't happen. So they do they look to you for guidance? I mean, like now that. Well, it's kind of like, it's like one of those things, it's like no one even thinks about it anymore. Right. It's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. Somebody from the outside goes, well, he makes all the decisions. And blah, but, but see, we, I mean, we just, as a band, we discuss everything. We talk about everything. And, and plenty of times they disagree with me. And plenty of times I go, well, you're wrong, or I think you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm right most of the time, and this is the way it's going to be. And, I mean, it's just one of those weird things. It just works that way. Other people, it might not work. Other personalities, it does. We just have that weird combination of personalities. And, and what were weaknesses when we were a year old are strengths now. So. so, would you continue your career as a solo artist then? Or? So I really don't know. I have I have interest to do other... I mean, for me, for me it's like it's like a baseball team or something, you know? You you uh, you look at the you look at the park you play in, you know, and you and you and you pick your team according to the conditions, mm -hmm. you know, and and it's kind of like that. I mean, I've geared the Smashing Pumpkins to to the strengths of the four people, you know, the drumming and the guitar playing and the songwriting. I mean, I've and I and I've steered away from other things, and it might be really um, cocky of me to think that. I could do what I do in some other area and still pull it off as effectively as I pull what we do off. So I don't know. I'm not. It's. I'm not sure I have the same kind of confidence. Like um, every once in a while, I've I've done gigs under this name, the Star Children, you know, and we've done a couple gigs. And 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 the idea with the Star Children was it was like you know, the, it was my way to vent something else beyond the pumpkins. Mm -hmm. And every gig is different. So what, what is that, venting it beyond the pumpkins? Is it a different style of music, or is it...? Well, we've done two gigs, and we're going to probably do another gig in March. And it's just like whatever genre I want to participate mm -hmm. in. The first gig we played was like complete minimalistic, you know, like something like Velvet Underground-y, feedback-y, two-chord songs. Mm -hmm. And, it, and people loved it. People still come up to me, and, and, and they don't even know I'm in the pumpkins. They talk about that show. Mm -hmm. and the next time we did, we did this kind of like fetus noise, no vocals, mm -hmm. like soundtrack music. Mm -hmm. Everybody hated it, mm -hmm. you know? But I enjoyed it mm -hmm. because it was like doing something different. The next gig we're going to probably play is going to be something like kind of primal screaming, like samples cool. with, with rock, you know, Black Sabbath samples mm -hmm. and... Funky drums. And stuff. So is that is that a Smashing Pumpkins lineup, but under a different name, or is it's, it with it's, different people? It's it's whoever I want to be in it. Really? Yeah. That's There's cool. about like ten people are unofficially in the band. You know. Other musicians or just? Yeah, I have my I have friends in this band, Catherine, mm -hmm. and they've played with me, and uh, you know, um, that's it really. Now that I think about it, no one else has really played. It's basically been my friends from Catherine, one guy for one gig and one guy the other gig, mm -hmm. and one gig Jimmy played and one gig James played. Where do you guys play when you do this? Um, both times, it, well, one time it was at the Metro, one time it was at Dreamers. 
Do you like to tour? <laughs> I'm liking it more. Yeah. How Basically come? because I don't have to move equipment anymore, you know. It's right. the drag of it, you know, that I don't like. Playing shows is so amazing. Our shows are just I mean, they're just so completely like out of control now. I mean just it's really, you know, it sounds like a real James thing to say, but they're really turning into these kind of like out of control, ritualistic kind of more than a rock concert mm -hmm. kind of shows. And it's really amazing. It's really getting into that amazing stage. Are you guys like are you I haven't seen you guys recently, obviously. Are you guys really into the stage setup? No. Thing, or is it just we're very minimal at this point. Bare bones, just music. Get up on stage. Our managers wanted us to take lights on our first tour, and we absolutely refused. Mm -hmm. You know, they want us to have this heavy duty psychedelic light show. I think it's more powerful without... Well, I think at this point, it is. I think if you're playing the 4,000 people... Can I get another beer, please? Can I get another beer? Hey, can I have some hot tea? I think if you're playing the 4,000 people, you need to a little more than like sweat. Sure. Oh yeah. But you know, we play clubs, you know, like five hundred people. Everybody can see you, everyone can see the way that you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there is there is a real power in just getting up on stage and playing and connecting with people on a straight one to one. So level. is it a show for you? I mean is it an aspect of your personality that doesn't come out at all? <clears throat> or is it I've had a lot of people say to me that they don't recognize me on stage. Really? You know? I'm I'm really like not hung up about a lot of things. So the difference between like me sitting at this table and me on stage doesn't seem that different mm -hmm. to me. Well, I was gonna say now that I know you, I'll have to. Uh, I'll have I mean, to but, I mean, you know, I'm tell you I, I see that. I I just I being on stage amplifies whatever aspect of you is out at the moment. You know, if the monster is at the mic, you know, I start telling people to fuck off and, you know, that whole mm -hmm. thing starts and, it, you know, these near riot, you know, antagonistic situations where everyone wants to jump up the stage and kill us, you know. Right. Other times, you know, charming, funny, you know, I mean, yeah. it just, it amplifies because, you know, I mean, it's like anything, you know, the situation is focused and, you know, it's a microcosm, 45 minutes, an hour. And, and this hour leaves such a vast impression. You know, what does one hour of your daily life leave an impression on you? You probably don't even remember what right. you did some of the hours of today. Right. But that one hour leaves a vast impression. So the attention, you know, attention span in the audience is high. You've got this fucking total focus. Electric energy. So when you make a joke, it's probably funnier. And right. Every gesture is grander. And so when you were in Europe, what? Did you, were you just in the UK or did you go? We only played two shows. We played Rotterdam, this big, huge festival. Mm -hmm. How was that? Um, what's a, what's a f playing a festival? Well, when I talked to Buffalo Tom last year, they were talking about a festival that they played, and that was like. Well, really it wasn't an outdoor. It was an indoor. It was this indoor. indoor festival. There were four rooms going, and this night wow. there were two nights. The night we played, in one room Nick Cave was reading poetry, in the other room Nine Inch Nails was playing, and then this other room Nirvana's playing, and then we're playing in this room with Sonic Youth. You know, it was just like. It was just like total insanity. Mm -hmm. Too much, you know. It was almost a crime that there was all this good music right, going on right. and not even enough time to go see it. Mm -hmm. um, it was cool. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously bigger. It's kind of strange. What did you think of, of Europe in terms of their response? Well, like Janet was just like, oh, you know how Janet is. Oh, I was so surprised that they liked them. You know, I'm like. Why? You know, well, to every, me, it seems like it would totally be their thing, you know? You know, I mean, I'll contend this till the day I die, but everyone was worried about, like, how we were going to be perceived in Europe. Everyone was worried before our album came out how we were going to be perceived in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I just look at it like there are things about our band, our music, the way we play live that transcend genre. You know what I mean? It goes beyond being a rock band in a corner. It it becomes something bigger than that. And to a lot of people, our album is bigger than any other album they have. It means more to them. It strikes a chord. And the way we play live and the, and the emotion that transfers between the band and the audience, mm -hmm. even though it's a really weird thing, I, I haven't quite figured it out yet. 
I just think it transcends, and I think, I, I'm not saying that we are a great band, I don't think we have achieved our potential yet, but I think that's the earmark of a great band is transcendence. Mm -hmm. A show doesn't feel like a normal rock concert. You can go to a hundred concerts and only one or two will really give you, you know, it's like you feel like you've been fucked, you know? That's what rock is supposed to do. It's, you know, it's, it's based and rooted in sexuality. And, it, and that's the way you should walk out. You should feel like you had this orgasmic, incredible experience. And those, the best concerts I've ever seen, it's like, I'm devastated. Yeah. You know? that's, why, that's why I'm psyched to see Nirvana this weekend. You know, it's like one of the shows, because I saw them two years ago when they were touring with Tad. I just want to go in and have my head blown off for an hour. Right. And go home. That's what you're paying for. But, you know, that's what you hardly ever get. You know? And it's, I mean, I've had that experience in basement parties where friends of mine just get together and jam. And then I'll go see your show here. I mean, I've been to so many shows in the last two years. Mm -hmm. I can't even, I don't even remember. But the shows that I remember that blow me away, Babes in Toyland. Blow me away. I don't know what it is, though. I mean, you know, now that there's you bring that up, something, there's something else. There's something else. You it know. goes beyond, like, people standing in a corner playing their guitar, singing their songs. You know, who can put a gauge on it? Obviously, you can't bottle it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I mean, like, going to see Jane's Addiction, which is supposed to be the most massive experience anybody's supposed to have, you know, and I've seen, like, three times the first record, or when I hear the strains from the single from their last record, it's kind of like, oh. You know, you, like I was saying before, it calls back, ex, you know, certain experience or where you first heard that song or where I first heard one of your songs or like the first time I saw your video on MTV on Headbangers Ball, <laughs> which, you know, I had just moved here. I had just moved here and I was staying with a friend of mine. It's just like, oh, Smashing Pumpkins, I love these guys. And I'm like, they have a video with, you know, we just had gotten done seeing a rat video. I'm like, what is going on? You know, it was really weird. But I mean, that's. I go to shows, I don't know if it's like a jaded thing, my dad's a musician, like yours, and um, he doesn't he doesn't do it anymore in the respect of like the rock thing, but I grew up around that and around him just going, oh, you know, you've got to hear this song, and he would just, he would like play me music when I was a little kid, you know, Rod Stewart, you've got to hear the oh, great melody, blah, 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 you know, so I grew up wanting that from everything. Right. You want it from everything, but you're just you're just not going to get it from, you know, going to see. I can't even think of like a really bad show or somebody like the Blake Babies that just don't get me. You know, it's kind of like, well, this is okay. Or Run Westy Run, who, like, they had one show last year that like you know rocked me for days. And I saw them. I could talk about. Saw them open here for Soul Asylum. They were fucking amazing. Yeah. And I've seen them other times. It was like. Yeah. But this one show I saw, I mean, totally amazing. They, uh... I mean, last... you forget where you are. Yeah, you know? that was how it was. It's really weird because I saw them play at the Caboose in Minneapolis, and they were headlining. I forget who opened for them, but it was like, you know, everything was right. The lights, you know, they had like, I don't know if they had a smoke machine or dry ice or something, but it was for just for a couple songs. They had a strobe light for another one. And you know when you feel your hair stand on end... You know, and I'm drinking Red Stripe, and I'm sick, and I'm still having this, like, hot time, you know. It's like, I, that's all I talked about for days. But there are other times when I've seen them, like, you guys are terrible, you know. And when they opened here for Firehose, they weren't that great. You know, it's kind of like, you know, or when I listen to their record, I'm like, you know, there's more. They just lost one of their guitar players, too. He quit, so. They have some guy from Magnolias or... Toadstool or of both, I guess, filling in for them. But it's just not the same. But I guess I think all the good bands are capable of having shows like that, you know. But that's why I'm. I don't. When are you guys playing? You guys are playing here in November. November twenty something. With the Chili Peppers. Are yeah. you doing two shows? Hmm? Are you doing two shows or just one? I only know about one. It's the Aragon. So I probably only do one. Yeah. It's five yeah. bucks. Right. So what about that? I mean, are you? How did you hook up with the Chili Peppers? I heard Nirvana was going to get that gig, actually, the opening gig for them. And then I hadn't heard that. I heard, I heard about other bands, but... I think everybody kind of every, was in the mix. 
we, people hear about, but you know what? Every time something comes up, it's always like ten bands. And, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I don't know if we got it by default or, you know, I heard there were there were bands trying to buy on that tour, mm-hmm. you know, like actually pay to be on it. So I think we were chosen because you know they wanted to have us on. And we we turned on the Pixies tour. You know. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't. Have you heard their new record? Yeah, I like it a lot. You like it? It's okay. I um. It hits like me a lot better than the last. Last one, one. exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly, it's long. That that would probably be my only complaint. It's that it is long. Yeah. Um, because I can't. I mean, I like records that are like maybe nine to eleven songs. Maybe there's a, there's better. a point. Where you know it's like. You know, there's a band, there's kind of like a thrash ability band called the Cadillac Tramps. They just played here. I've been onto their thing for a while, and I really like them, but their record is too damn long. It's too damn long. I, after, like, the 12th song, I'm like, all right, or I'll start it at 5 and then go to 14. You know, it's got 14 tracks, and it's like, you know, whatever. I can't, I can't take it. And I don't know if that kind of lack of attention span is really bad. I just think after a while... You know, I'd rather listen to the same record twice in a row than listen to 14 songs that are different sometimes. When the Pixies, Pixies were another show when, where I really felt like, wow. And I'd seen them before and it never, it didn't do that to me, but there was something about their show that was just really, really great. You know. Anyway, the, the point I was making when I said that was that, I mean, the people in Europe were no different than the people mm-hmm. in America. Right. It didn't matter where they were from. Why do you think everybody has this preconceived notion that they're going to be such a hard audience? Because I think I think I think people pay a lot more attention to alternative music. Criticism is higher in the press than any criticism you get here. I mean, if you're going to get criticized in the press here, we're going to get criticized on a on a, on a national level where people are really going to care. You know, there you've got the weeklies. Right. If they're going to if they're going to trot on you. They're going to trot on you for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah. you know? When they take after you, you know, they and everyone was afraid we were gonna get trounced and it just didn't happen, you know. Our live shows have really shut a lot of critics up. Right. Yeah, I'm psyched I'm psyched to see are you guys gonna be playing like newer new material? Yeah. Some people will get really mad at us because we won't play so you know, it's I'm I I'm purposely concentrating on certain aspects of what we do now just because of I'm 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 more concerned about impact than I am about anything else. Mm-hmm. I mean, we are strictly in maximum impact mode because 90% of the people that are seeing us have never seen us before, and you know, I want to leave a footprint on their brain so that they'll always come back for more. Do you tailor your show for a city? Mm-hmm. Like, do you tailor a show for a city? It sometimes, yeah. We have, yeah. So, like, I mean, put it this way. When you're in Salt Lake City, you're going to be a m- little more inclined to stretch out a little more. And when you're in L.A., you're going to go for the fucking throat because right. you know there's people there who have a lot. I mean, whether you, whether you like it or not, there are people in cities like New York and L.A. who are so influential that their, their one little opinion can really be detrimental. So when we play cities like New York and LA, we go for the fucking throat. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the way it is. And, and when you're in, when you're in the middle of the country, you're not as hung up about it. And in some ways, those are the best gigs because mm-hmm. you relax and you're showing people more than one side. We've probably only been showing people like a couple sides of us, but it's been a pretty heavy duty couple sides of us. What's a rehearsal like for you guys? How long do you guys usually do? Uh, about three hours. It's just us going over new songs. It's basically me scratching my head. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of like, man, I can't get this together. And, mm-hmm. you know, Is that where a lot of the the arguments oh, yeah. come out? It's oh, yeah. Universal. Uh-huh. It's a lot like a relationship, I think, like a really close friendship or a relationship that you have with a boyfriend or girlfriend, I think. Because you, you can get mad at somebody and well, know that that's just part of the deal. The other day at practice, you know, James is sitting in a chair, you know, he's not standing up, which shows that he's demotivated to begin with. He's sitting in a chair, and, and, you know, we go, we're like, we're trying to work on this one part of a song, you know, we're trying to change something, you know, and you go, okay, uh, okay, do the part four times, and then we'll do this change. So you start the song, you do the part four times, you come to this new change, and he blows the change. 
you start again, you do it again. I mean, he knows exactly why you're doing this, to practice this one little thing. Mm -hmm. You do it again, he blows the change again. You know what I mean? So you just go like, all right, all right, all right. No, you just start screaming because it's like, why are you there? Why are you there? If you don't want to be there, go home. Mm -hmm. Don't waste Have people gone home? Never. We've had storm out, stomp your feet out arguments. We've had practices end in the middle of practice, but, but I mean, no one's ever so out of line that it gets to the point of like choosing sides. Or, mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. It's, it, it, you have to get over things so fast. You just don't have time to dwell. You don't have time to hold grudges. There's just no time. You know? And it just, you know, it yeah. happens and it's over with because you got ten other things to deal with the next mm-hmm. day. So. so after you practice, do you go home and play guitar? Or do you go home and write? Or do you read? Um, I mean, I'm more interested in you, like, away from the musician thing or finding out other things that influence you as a musician that aren't music, mm-hmm. like books. Reading it. Or what do you read? Uh, I, I never read fiction. I, I mainly read, like, autobiographies and biographies. Um, philosophical type books, mm-hmm. you know, like and uh, stuff like William Burroughs, and, um, just fucked up kind of things, you know. I mean, it's it's all it's all kind of interrelated to this kind of sub drug consciousness, mm-hmm. you know. I don't know what you want to call it. But, you know, it's that sub drug consciousness that attracts you to things like, you know, I don't want to sound like cliche yuppie but like you know things like David Lynch you know mm-hmm. you're attracted to those types of films and you're attracted to those types of books and you're attracted to certain types of music because it appeals to that you know what that, shaped you in that direction I mean like it might sound like kind of a weird end to this kind of question but like was it like your high school experience what was that like you know um, you know Diane, I, Diane, <laughs> Diane says that you're probably pretty much the same now in a lot of ways that you were then oh yeah you know. I was just a geek in the wrong place. You know? My personality. But we still is like fuck you. Is oh yeah, my personality was so strong that I couldn't I couldn't blend. You know, mm-hmm. it's like I it's Henry Miller. You know, I'm not a totally Henry Miller head. I don't know how much you know about Henry Miller. You know, but a lot of people stand on Henry Miller as like the voice of their consciousness. Which right. Henry Miller was a little too extreme. I'm a, I'm a little happier than that. But there's this one thing I was reading Henry Miller. And, he was talking about like no matter how much he smiled and how much how, ma- how many jokes he told, there was always this element in him that made people uneasy, and that really struck a chord to me because as long as I can remember, there's always this element in me that makes people really uneasy. I think it's just the fact that they can feel me staring through them. Mm-hmm. I, I I just I stare through people and it makes them really uncomfortable. Do you make friends easily? Um. Yeah. Um, I mean, for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. I mean, I'm sure you've got a lot of friends, like yeah. people who want to be around you for the star power no, thing. I'm, but I'm, I'm pretty much like everybody because I think I can I can really relate to people on their own terms. I mean, my father being a musician, I got to know lots of different types of people. You know, mm-hmm. like outcasts of society, and and a lot of people say that I surround myself with freaks, people that only I can appreciate. Like I have this friend Nick. Everybody in the world thinks he's, he's, I mean, he is pretty much insane. Mm -hmm. He's totally crazy. He's like crackhead now, you know. He's on his way to death. You know, he's totally, I mean, just totally an out-of-control person. Mm -hmm. And everybody I know cannot stand him. And I was on really one of the few, I'm really one of the few people who can relate to him. Because I think I can understand, you know, I just, I find that part in myself that can relate to that part in himself. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I relate to people. So I I pretty much like everybody. Mm -hmm. But I just, um, I don't know. It's hard to explain what it is I don't like about people. See, you can even like everybody, but still hold part of yourself away from them, too. Yeah, there's very few people that I I actually, you know... um, I just don't believe in having one, one-sided relationships with people, you know. There has to be something there that you can share, you know. I mean, I used to just give myself away to anybody, and I don't do that anymore. You know, my mojo. Was it being hurt, or was it being misunderstood, just, just or that, not getting something out of it? You know it? what, just, just, just realizing that everyone's not like you, you know. Mm-hmm. Everyone, there's a lot of people who don't care, they just don't care. They don't care that they're going to be, like, their life is going to be boring. They just don't care. 
or if they don't, if they do care, they're, they're, they got it tucked away in some corner of their, their psyche because... That's why I asked you what it was like going back to where you came from, like going back to Glen Ellen. Yeah. I don't know, I just, I don't allow myself to feel it, you know. I can't feel sorry for people who have doomed themselves. I, I... But you can befriend them, obviously. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm the type of person that came from a situation that when people saw me doing okay would say, boy, we really thought you were going to be really fucked up. Mm -hmm. We're so amazed that you're not strung out on drugs and... I mean, you know, my situation at home was that crazy and fucked up and blah, blah, you know, and I had plenty of excuses to be a loser, and, and for a while I pretty much was, but, you know, I, I, I stopped living a lie and stopped pretending that, you know, God was going to grant me some gift out of the sky, and I set myself onto a task. How old were you? When, when I started to happened? feel like that? Well, when, when you got out of it, I mean... I mean, I can kind of relate to that whole feeling sorry for yourself and just waiting for somebody to bail you out kind of thing. Yeah. But so how old were you when that didn't, when you said, well, obviously. Nineteen. Yeah. You didn't go to college, did you? No. I mean, I, I knew I didn't want to go to college because I knew I wanted to play music and then, you know, I had this kind of fucked up year and a half where I, you know, like, you know, went through like 30 girls and, and you know, uh, it just... You know, this lost year and a half, you know, where I pursued this endless trail of nothingness, you know, and uh, I just, I just, you know, I just can feel that, what it felt like to, to be in Florida, to have no money, you know, there's no girlfriend to lean on, I had nothing, I mean, I barely had a band. Where were you in Florida? St. Petersburg. I lived there for 10 years, not in St. Petersburg, but in Florida. You know, I was living on a floor in a, a storefront, you know, non-existent person. And I used to go visit this guy who had a clothing store. And I just remember walking up one day and he had this, you know, I kind of consider myself this guy's kind of friend, you know. Right. I come and talk to him. Well, he had this new friend, like this guy he just met. He knew him like three days, you know. And I walked up and this new friend, like, they both turned to me and the new friend looks up at me and says, oh, it's the nowhere man. And they both kind of chuckled. You know, like, and, and and that was just one of those symbolic moments where you just realize that you are nothing. You, know? you don't mean anything to anybody. You don't even mean anything to yourself. And that was really when it started to... It took me a long time, but it really started to... I mean, I had it in me, you know. I mean, you have to have it in you. You have to have that desire. I mean... You know, uh, I could have gone home, cut my hair. I could have come back here, cut my hair, gotten a normal job, and life goes on, you know. But I was determined, and, and I just, um, I just think a lot of people, and I have known a lot of people, that they just cannot step back from their own person and their own little high drama of a life and realize what it is they want and what it is they really want. And, 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 and make the sacrifices to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm finally reuniting with my family, but, you know, um, I lost two-thirds of my family. I was disowned from everybody. You know, um, just, you know, I just didn't give it up. I, it's hard to explain, you know. It just, it's just so fucked up, you know, because I, I think so different now, you know. It's like, it's hard to believe that, you know, you think, like, how could I have been so stupid, or, you know? Yeah. When you, when you came back here... So, so I just want to say this. I mean, that's why when people question pumpkins, people question me, it's like, I've got that, I've got that real strength that they can't take away from Well, you me. know. Well, but it, it's not even like a, it's, it's not even like a no thing. It's just like, you've got this rock in you that's real, you know, you, you, you've suffered, you know, I, I mean, you know, my suffering was not, you know, this, this, uh, fake teenage drama suffering, it was real suffering, I still pay for it, mm -hmm. and my pain is real, and that's why any, anybody can say what they want about my band or the music that I write, but I am myself, you know, call me whatever you want, but I am the person I am. Are you, you know? your music? Oh, yeah, definitely. So that's you that we're hearing. 
I don't think I've completely established my musical identity to the point where I think it's completely separate. That's that's my that's my inner kind of goal is to push the music into an area that, that distinguishes it really apart. I think I think lyrically in a lot of ways I've done that. I think singing wise I've done that. And I just think in terms of attitude I've done that. But the music is still I've got to push it even further away. You know, it's just really hard to do when you're you play loud and mm-hmm. rock. So you're 24? 24. When will you be 24? Uh, March 17th. In eternal Pisces. Like my brother. That's, <clears throat> yeah, I would have never guessed. Well, I mean, I, I, I was born to be a loser, you know? I was born to be one of those guys that was too smart and, and, and had too much talent and just didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. You ever known anybody like that? My boyfriend? Probably, exactly. I really wanted him to come because, you know, <clears throat> you hear from varying people, oh, Billy Corgan, what an asshole. Oh, he's really great. Or, I just I just think a lot of people kind of, you know, I mean, I, I'm dogged with, like, all this press that I have and other, other people who are publicists at labels who are also writers like Mark Woodleaf who, like, have known you or talked to you in the past. And, or people who hate you and don't know you, like some friends of mine. You know, they hate your guts, and it's, or they hate your band, which basically, you know, if they hate your band, they hate you, you know. And uh, it's like, yeah, I, I totally understand that. I'm the same way myself in some ways. I don't, I mean, I identify with what you're saying. I can't say that I have suffered. I've had my own personal trauma that might seem no, but, trivialized. But, no, but, but see, I, I don't even look at it like that. All you, you know... You know, it's like I was watching this thing on TV and the guy was talking about you're born alone, you die alone. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, the majority of time that you spend in your life is spent alone. And you have those inner thoughts and those inner desires and inner pulses that a lot of people let die. They're so out of touch with the person that they really are. And there's nothing more. It's so sad. To see someone who's like broken, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. The events of their life and the situation and having to have money that just broke them. That's the kind of person my dad is. He's broken. It's like What's the, your dad doing? he just like fixes cars. You know. I mean, there's nothing more disheartening to see someone who has such great potential and has just fucking given it up or lost it or given it away. You know? And and that's what I'm saying. No one can take that away from me. And no one will. No one ever will, you know. So they can say whatever they fucking want. You is know? your dad proud of you? I think he is, but it's it comes with a lot of baggage. It comes with an awful lot of baggage. No, I say that because how I see my dad is the same way. He's forty five years old, I think. My father's forty three or something, so and, but my dad's like when he quit music. It was more because of my mom, you know, my mom was just kind of like, you've got to quit, you've got two kids, whatever. And, uh, so he quit, and he didn't want to quit, but he did. So I feel some sort of kind of responsibility for that, even though I was like eight when he quit, you know. Um, and he would still do music. We had the cops called on us a million times, you know, because my dad would like plug in and in this nice neighborhood and suburban Minneapolis, you know. And, my dad would be crazy, or I'd come home from work at 1 o'clock in the morning, my dad would be drunk playing his guitar because he and my mom had a fight or something, which rarely happened, but it never scared me. I always kind of understood, like, why he was doing it. But he is broken in that way. You know, my mother lives vicariously through me in a different way, you know. When she was 19, she had me. You know, I'm 23, and... That's really funny, because it's, like, the same age my parents had me. yeah. You know, I'm 23 now, and I have no kids, you know, and I have this job, and, you know, I write, and you know, blah, 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 and she thinks that's really cool, and, you know, keep going, and don't give that up, and my dad's just like, he's really proud of me, but at the same time, he's like, don't forget, you know, what makes you human, you know, and, like, relationships, you know, like, I went through a billion guys, you know, like what you were saying, 30 different girls or whatever, 
you know, I went through a bunch of different guys, never found what I was looking for, or found almost, gave it up, you know, and, and it's like... Sounds pretty similar. Yeah, it's, it's like, but then you find it, you know, and I, and I moved away from it when I moved here, which was a problem, because there have been a lot of fights. I mean, he and I are both very much individuals, it's like two very selfish, kind of artistic people trying to be in a relationship together and trying to give, and it's hard to give when the other person's not giving, you know, because... you're selfish yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, you're just, you know, when, when you're that selfish and you're just used to things coming to you, certain things from other people, it's really hard, and, you know, but he moved down here, you know, and he gave up a lot for that, you know, which was, like, pretty amazing, and it's, but like, seeing my dad the way he is, it's just like, yeah, I'm really proud of you, don't, you know do what you want to do and if that means getting married and having a kid that's great you know or if it means yes I haven't gotten that kind of support yeah I, it's it's weird my mom does not support that at all they were just here this weekend and my mom really likes Dan and everything but you know she's like oh you know she just passes it off as maybe something else I'm like I've been with this guy for seven months which is like seven years to me you know I'm like you have to understand this is a big deal you know and my dad is just like pretty cool with it you know and my brother's like totally mainstream, you know, he's like 19, and lives in Arizona, plays golf, you know, whatever, he, ha he has never heard of you or any of the other, you know, music that I talk about, and he just, you know, but I don't think my dad gets anything from him, they don't fight, I fight with my dad all the time, we argue about stuff, I tell him he sells out, and he gets really mad, you know, I'm like, you sold out, you totally gave in, you know, why? And it's like, I did it for you, you know? And I'm like, well, fuck, I would have been really glad if you would have stayed a musician and we could have lived Yeah, I, I got laid the same trip, so. You know? Would you have been glad if your dad had stayed a musician, though? I mean, it's like, I would I have loved to, like, but I wouldn't have turned out the way I have. It would have been completely different. I might have hated it while it was happening, you know, looking back, it's always, like, perfect. You know? I lost a lot just by him, the virtue of him playing anyway, so. Did he just play out around here? Was he like everywhere? Oh, he or? played. He played nationally, but it, you got It was more in the context of a band that would come in. I mean, this is more like a '70s type of thing, mm -hmm. but would come into a town and would play like a, a week at a place, and he would come and have a good time and dance, and not like a dance thing, like a rock kind of right. bass thing, but but still very much involved in people pleasing. Do you want to get close to him again? I don't know. I don't really know. It's a really hard question for me to answer. It might be a little too personal too. I'm sorry. No, I don't mind talking about it at all. I mean, I have nothing to hide. It's just, um... He's hurt me in ways that I'll never even understand. And he's failed me as a father in a lot of ways. He has, I mean, there's a lot of things he hasn't failed at. Mm -hmm. But some of the things that he failed at, I consider, like, almost basic necessity type things. And I just, I, I never feel that I can approach him without him having his own agenda. I mean, he's the type of person, he, he, he's the type of person that you say, uh, the most fucked up thing happened to me. And you'll tell him the story, and he, he doesn't even absorb and before he even thinks about it he's telling you some story of his mm -hmm. you know like like a story that tops your story well this one time it was fucking these six chicks and you know what I mean it's like it's just like I can't compete on that level right. I wish he would just accept it at the level that I that's like friends it's like friends that I, ha that I have you know, or... but, but you know what I told him once I said if you were my friend you would you wouldn't be my friend. Okay, but I'm, I'm talking friends like oh. acquaintance. Like, oh, yeah. Like my roommate. I thought that's what you were saying. Okay, but I mean like real friends, okay, whatever, they wouldn't do that. But like my roommate or whatever, you know, I don't know her. I just moved in with her when I came here, you know, and she, you know, I'll tell her, oh, this fucked up thing happened at work today or I feel this way now, you know, I'm really lonesome or you know, I feel bereft because, you know, I have none of what I had when I had in Minneapolis or whatever and she... She's just like, oh, well, blah, 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 blah. She's from Riverside, California, Total Val, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I just let her talk. Let her talk, go in my room, and write it down. Write it on the bus, 
write it wherever I can. You know, it just because I think to a lot of people, other people don't make a difference. You know, I mean, I can relate to what you're saying about your dad because my mom's the same way. She won't top it with another story. She'll just nod and smile and keep reading. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, well, you know, I'm sorry, you're a total workaholic, but you know, if I told you that I had five abortions in the last year, you know, what would you do? You know, which I haven't. But you know, I mean, just anything for the shock value, just to get something out of her. You know, or just some sort of concern. I mean, I can understand that. You know. I can see what you're saying about that. But I love my dad because he's a musician. He totally, he doesn't like a lot of what I like, but he respects it. Yeah, sad my father does not respect the genre of music that I play. Really? Not at all. Does, it, does he say it's not music? Oh, no, no. Or does he just hate it? He just picks out of it what he understands, and then to him that means that... Like, he, he'll pick out the Hendrix part of it or mm -hmm. something. And then he just, you know, he, he uses that as an equation to say that I'm not doing anything different. I don't think it's bad to let your, your musical influences come through, though. I think at some point, though, you have to... You have to grow beyond them. There are, part, there are parts in your music, I was just telling Dan today, there are parts in your music where it sounds like you should be doing something. Like if you did this one thing that you're not doing, it would be a Hendrix song. Like in Rhinoceros, there's a part where it would totally turn into Hey Joe if you just did a certain thing, but you don't do it, and that's what makes it totally original. Uh -huh. You know, and... I mean, it, 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 it always comes down to there's only 12 notes and there's only... Totally. I mean, there's a point where you're just totally strapped by the medium. There's just no other way around it. That's why I have interest in like samplers and things like that because it's creating, you know, out of chaos and pieces. You of have things. to let me know when that happens. I'd love to see that because uh, that would be really cool. I just, I'm trying to use, I'm, and I'm trying to use something like that and working with like a sampler and stuff to open up my mind to the possibilities of, of my own band. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy that I used to go out with, he plays with the Tar Babies, and he's in another band called Booty Fruit that uses all samplers and stuff like that and that's why he did it too. Which, which gun? Dan Bitney, the drummer. I've gone out with all drummers. If I ever go out with guys in the band, it's always drummers. I don't know why. But he uh, he started this other band. <laughs> don't like guitar players, huh? Well, no, that's, that's not No, I'm it. just saying because there's some girls who always seem to go out with guitar players. Really? Yeah. I, they wind up being drummers and I don't even know. You know, it's kind of like they'll be like, oh, I'm in this band. I'm like, really? What do you play? Drums. Of course you do. You know, but... Um, <laughs> he was really cool. We had the same birthday and stuff, so you know, we, we always thought it was some sort of cosmic thing or whatever. I still talk to him, but Booty Fruit's like doing way, you know, is way more satisfying to him, I think, than the Tar Babies just because it's taken like a totally, you know, I mean, Tar Babies taking, you know, looking to blood, sweat, and tears for influence, you know, he just had it with that, you know. It's like I've taken it as far as I can go, you know, so they do the sampler rap thing and whatever, and it's really good. Yeah, I mean, there's a point where you feel really, t you feel your hands are tied by your own monster. But see, in in that band, it's not his monster; it's Bucky's monster, completely. <clears throat> he's manic depressive. I mean, he's he's like how you are, only more evil times three. You know, I mean, because he, everything in that band totally hinges on his mental state. You know, which the other guys smoke so much pot they don't care. Dan's a really talented musician, so he cares. But he smokes too much pot to forget about it. He's a great drummer. Yeah, he's really good. And he plays other things. I mean, he started out playing guitar, you know. And it's just, it's weird. Musicians are, are, are like, are weird people in that sense, I think. You know, but I really, I mean, I play guitar, but I don't, it's not an all consuming I don't get out of bed and go, where's my guitar, you know. Nor do I go, where's my pen and paper? It's kind of like... I used to. I mean, I used to drive girls nuts. I used to, like, fuck some girl and get out of bed and play guitar. And... It's too bad for them if it drives them nuts, though. <laughs> Did you ever meet a girl who understood that? That's what it is. Yeah. Do you go out with somebody now who gets it? Oh, that's good. Kind of. Long story. Some other time. Some other time. <laughs> That was the whole Melody Maker reference. Oh, really? Yeah. Tell me about that. 
It's off the record if you want it to be. Well, I have to go to the bathroom. I'll tell you when okay. I come back from the bathroom. Okay. I have to think of my party line. <laughs> You know, TV, it's made everything in these, you know, like there's a lot of magazines now that really represent that kind of mentality. Oh, yeah. You know, look at, uh, what magazine is it? Like Cream or inter even Interview now. Interview, interview, used, to be, like interview used to be pretty good. Yeah. You look at it now, there'll be a full page picture of somebody and three questions and three two-sentence answers. Yeah, that's, yeah, they do that. Cream does that. There's no, like, see, I don't believe in demystifying... Finding out, finding I mean, out what's behind a mystery. There's, isn't a, there's a fine line between uh, mystery and, and, and star propagation. You know? Sure. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with finding out what's behind a mystery. It will still remain that. Any answer that you give is not going to completely explain everything to everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. People always want to know what my songs are about. You know? I mean, I'd have to sit down and tone, you know. Exactly what I was thinking, and you know, I mean, it, you know, like you know, they have those laser discs now. Uh -huh. They have like they have like it on so on one channel, the laser disc. There's like the the director and the actor talking about the movie. I mean, I have to do that. I'd have to be sitting there explaining my mentality. But you know, why people would ever want to know that? Whatever. I mean, for for your own information, that's great. Trying to trying to explain that to you know, for us, thirty thousand people. That's to me. To me, that's taking all the art out of writing. Or you know, I mean, you can make a feature or an interview into something really cool. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, there and was it's, ugh. there was this one article that this guy wrote even before our album came out. He was just talking about why he liked us. It was from uh, uh, Milwaukee. This magazine called Ricochet. Speedball, Spaceball, Spaceball Ricochet. Bill McClay. Yeah, I know him. And um, it's cool. Um, and it was just like a two-page thing. And in two pages, the guy really summed up what we do well. And it was just really nice to read. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so effective. It wasn't even an interview, really. He had a couple quotes for me that he talked to me after the gig. Mm -hmm. But he really managed to sum up the, you know, the, the bass sexual element and the push and pull of our music and the, the tease part of it. Yeah. Well, that, that's funny then that I would tell you that your record's good to fuck to because that's a bass that you, I mean, you brought that up a couple times while you're talking now that your music... It's, it's sexual based, I mean. I think most rock music is. I think people get away from that really easily. Or they go for the obvious, like the lyric. That's always obvious, you know, like the way you please me, ooh baby, you know, anything on the plays that you hear. You know, your music or your lyrics aren't overtly sexual or even... You know, it's so, more sensual. It's, yeah, exactly. But but at its base, it's just sexually right. related. Right. But but you know, um, you know, foreplay. It's just like you know, kiss. I mean, some people just want to fuck. They don't want to even kiss. I appreciate a good kiss. Yeah. You know, What's the problem with that? People just want. You know, they just want you to give everything away and. 
So that's like why I think like when you're saying that in interviews or people want to demystify everything, it's like almost, you know, all right, let's cut through the bullshit, let's fuck. So they're like, let's cut through the bullshit, what is your album title? What are you saying in your lyrics? I don't care. I appreciate what I get out of it from my own personal standpoint. I don't want you to rain on my parade. I hate it when artists rain on my parade. That's why I never ask a question. I mean, I just look at it like... You know? I just look at it like... When, when someone is, is, is kissing you or touching you, they're not telling you how to feel. They're offering you a stimulus, and then you, t- you take that stimulus, and it, and it pushes you where you want it to go, or how far you let yourself go. I, I, I'm there to provide an, a, you know, oral impetus, have you? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, people can take it for whatever they want. If they just want to hum along, fine. If they really want to... People write me all the time, please send me a lyric sheet. Well, obviously I didn't want to include a lyric sheet, and if you really want to know the lyrics, put on some headphones and, 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 and press the rewind button. And figure out what the fucking lyrics are. If it's that important to you, mm-hmm. they want me to hand over my lyrics. Obviously, I didn't want to give them to them. It's like, you know, wake up. You know? Everyone is so used to having everything handed to them on a fucking silver platter. You know. I think what you were saying about TV and over media. over imaged, you know, over everything, over over you know, the senses are completely bombarded. But it's totally, but it's totally, like, it's not a good bombardment. Like your video, okay, that bombards your senses in a kind of under, it's subtle. There's very little subtlety, I think, in anything. We saw the Madonna movie last night. We went to go see that. Okay. What a disgusting display. When I came out of there, I felt like... You know, whatever. I mean, I I have followed what she's been doing for the last ten years, or whatever. Whether she got her first thing or whatever, but I feel sorry for her. Oh yeah. I don't know if she, if this is like her tour scrapbook to all of her dancers. Did you feel sorry for her? I felt so sorry for her. Like not even sorry, like pity. Sorry, like. <laughs> You're living this like dumb illusion of what you think you are. But yeah, and she and she sits there and wonders why. You know, like when she's telling Sandra Bernhard, I think I've met everybody I want to meet. I was like, that woman needs to go thrift shopping in northern Minnesota. That woman needs to go on a real road trip or something. She needs something. You know, I mean, I did, I did pity her in a way, but it was in a sense of like. You, you know, made your bed. You're lying yeah, in it. Like just, you know, it's it's not, to take her analogy. It's not like she decided her. to be an opera singer or something. No. She decided to be a pop diva. You know? Well, and she, she got it. She's the best out of all of them, without a doubt. And I admire her for what she's done in terms of like women or whatever. But when I saw that movie, it was like it was right there in front of you, but it wasn't even her. You know. She lost a lot of ground with me with that movie. And. uh I had, I, I had waited a really long time to see it. Everybody told me about it, and I had seen her video things, like on the music awards and all that stuff, and I was like, wow, you know. And I saw it, and I was just kind of like, well, you know, I'm still, I still don't, I just didn't, it was weird, you know, and like, but it was all right in front of me, but it wasn't what I wanted, you know, instead of like, you know, if it's going to be right in front of me, it may as well be for real, you know, instead of just a bunch of bullshit. All shot in black and white, four different kinds of film we counted, you know, and, you know, and color you know, for some. You know, and a, and a portrait like that should have, for me, it took something away. It didn't add, it took it away. Mm-hmm. I mean, what I thought existed, I mean, I found out there was less of it than I, than I even imagined there was. See, when, I, when I'm sitting here talking to you about about these things okay whatever I you know it's good and you're being real with me if I had Madonna on the other side of the table you know that's why when I was asking you if you when you made your friends if you kept yourself away I was thinking of that movie because she she's really close to her dancers and she throws this big party and writes a big poem for her assistant but you can tell she's not all there like when she meets her old friend again oh yeah totally you know, awkward she, she, like, you can tell that she really cared about this person. She had really fond memories, but she had to go. It was really awkward. She didn't know what to say. She was caught in a position where her past kind of confronted her and maybe caught her a little bit off guard. And she wanted, So in order to rectify the whole situation, she booted. She just left. 
I didn't admire that at all. I thought that was kind of fucked up. But yeah, it was a weird movie. But you know, you are a star in the sense that Madonna is, not, you know, not. She might have been at, at one point in time. She might have granted a really solid, good interview, or just had a conversation with the interviewer. You know, but now. No matter who she's talking to, a lover, her parents, her best friend, it's not even her. And that's what I feel sorry for her for. And she doesn't know anymore. You know? I mean, I'm not, I'm not feeling sorry for her like, God, you know, I wish things could have been different for her. It's not like that. Yeah. Oh, no. I, I totally, everything you've said, I totally agree with. It's just like, that's really a shame. Because I bet she has a lot to say if she, should, if she could just cut through her own bullshit. She built a wall around herself. It's kind of disheartening in a way. I mean, I wouldn't mind getting the chance to meet her. Did you read the interviews that she did with Carrie Fisher in Rolling Stone? Two totally fucked up. I was more interested in Carrie Fisher, though. Yeah, Carrie she Fisher was, had she more was interesting funny. things to say. She was funny. She asked questions, you know, and so that was like. Oh, um. Yeah, I've always liked Carrie Fisher. But I just thought, you know, it's, it was just really gratuitous. I didn't really enjoy that, reading that at all. I was hoping for more, but I don't know why. Probably just more human. Human, who, human woman. Whatever. I was hoping for something. I didn't get it. And I couldn't have done a better job. When your subject is so closed off to everything. You know, like I interviewed a long time ago. I interviewed the Boo Dolls. It was a lot like this. You know, we're sitting in the uptown chat hanging out the other two dudes leave and the main guy <clears throat> still sitting there and he's like totally unsolicited starts going off about this girl that he had met in california that the whole album the last album that they did was about i have i have like 45 minutes of him on my tape just going off about this woman talking about religion i just sat there i, I you know i didn't say anything and then one of the other guys came, comes back and he's like you know this is the best interview we've ever done i'm like yeah because i didn't do anything those are the best ones. You know? You just hit play and let people talk. That's, I mean, I've talked a lot in this one, but that's because, I mean, I, I figured after talking to you on the phone even a couple times that I could probably just talk to you. you know? I'm not all I'm made out to be. I never, I never thought you were, you know? I mean, I never thought, I was like, I'm really nervous. I'm going to go interview this asshole now. Help, what am I going to do? You know, it was never like that. It was kind of like, because you got so much flack, I was really interested in talking to you. Because I would have made my own judgment after meeting you. Um, I don't judge asshole. That's uh, you and I are a lot like a lot like a lot of other people I know. I think a lot of people in our age group are like this. You know, just kind of like we're all outcasts and we're all trying to do our own thing. It happens to be music related or art related. Uh, I'm an asshole because I haven't backed down. I'm an asshole because I've done it my way, you know? You believe in what you're doing, too. I mean, I, I don't sense any compromise at all. And that's that's why I hate working at the label. I feel like I totally compromise myself by working for a label. You know, I like maybe two bands on the label. You know, and not even like, like, like I'm going to go home and listen to them, but like I go see them or something. And, uh... You know, get drunk, do ecstasy, I don't know, whatever, you know, just go see them. But also being in an environment where nobody else likes them either. So I'm in this environment where everybody is, we're supposedly promoting these bands and trying to get people interested in them, and nobody gives a shit. Nobody gives a fly.